Hello and welcome to the How to Exit podcast, where we introduce you to a world of small to medium business acquisitions and mergers. We interview business owners, industry leaders, authors, mentors, and other influencers with the sole intent to share with you what it looks like to buy or sell a business. Let's get rolling. And now a moment for our sponsors. I want to highly recommend you get Acquisition Aficionado Magazine. Every month, Acquisition Aficionado Magazine brings you tactics for business buying and selling you won't find anywhere else. Learn firsthand from industry leaders who share their success stories, featuring in-depth interviews and stories from leading figures in the business acquisition industry. This multi-platform mobile magazine speaks to acquisition entrepreneurs wherever they are in the journey. And I want you to visit acquisitionaficionado.com today. Hello and welcome to the How to Exit podcast. Today I'm here with Kevin Moyer. He is the practice leader of Transaction Strategy and Transformation Group. Thank you for being on the show, Kevin. No, thank you for having me. Man, I always like to start off with the origin stories and how you got into this space. Could you kind of give us your background and how you ended up a practice leader and even tell us what a practice leader is. Tell us what you do. Yeah, no, that sounds good. So I lead the transformation or the transaction strategy and transformation practice for Sachs LLP, which is a top 75 public accounting firm. Within our group, we focus heavily on, on kind of two work streams, one of which is buy and sell side diligence. So when you think financial quality of earnings, operational, standalone costing and commercial market sizing, that's one area that we focus on. And the second is much more focused on integration and transformative events within companies, right? A lot of private equity firms will acquire as well as strategics and need a roadmap or a playbook to properly integrate the company into a platform or perhaps another endpoint of the portfolio. So we do a lot of work in that arena as well. By way of background, prior to joining SACS, I was part of Ernst & Young Parthenon's transaction strategy and execution team, focused on sell and separate mandates, both public, private markets, and proceeding that. Uh, was a portfolio company CFO for two aerospace and defense private equity back manufacturing companies. Kind of what led down the path. It's a great question I ask myself all the time. Originally growing up, I had the, the goal of becoming a weatherman, which is not in the M&A world, of course. And uh, quickly found out that, that my predictions were as, as poor as theirs, so I'd probably make a great weatherman, right? But uh, worked a lot with my grandfather when I was younger. He was a large, relatively large real estate developer in Pennsylvania, Ohio, and some of the other states. It kind of just there got used to indirectly running businesses, looking at financials, dealing with banks. And as, as time progressed, kind of went into banking myself, started out on corporate credit analyses and moved to loan syndication type work. And I think just through the evolution, that was my segue into running acquisitions prior to going into private equity for a, an independent sponsor. It was a large single family office in New York City. Just like they say, hindsight's twenty twenty. I could see the dots connecting now looking backwards. But if you were to ask me 10 years ago, do, you, do I think I would have been in the position I'm in today? I'd probably say, you know what? I have no idea what position I'll be in 10 years from now. So very thankful for how it worked out. Enjoy what I do tremendously and really enjoy Providing value to lower middle market, which is predominantly where we, SACs, within my team, specialize and focus. That's awesome. So what are some of the, I noticed on your website and stuff, you guys do due diligence, and I'm always curious. I've only been in this space for about two and a half years, and I've seen some really creative stuff in, in, in small business financials. <laughs> What's the most creative thing you've come across when you're doing due diligence? I know people try to clean it up before they get to you, probably. I'm sure you guys come up with stuff in there that's in the financials that are just not supposed to be there. Depending on what side of the transaction we sit, predominantly we do sit on the sell side. So we're kind of the first cut of the quality of earnings before the buy side comes in and kind of tears into it. But we have seen everything under the sun. I have seen business owners pay for their child's wedding for their business. I have seen vacations that no business purpose whatsoever. I mean, at the end of the day, a lot of these are sole, proprietor sole proprietorships single member LLCs, the reality is at the time of the expense, they're probably not thinking of selling the business. When you think about adjusting out non-recurring or one-time items or just personal expenses, we tend to spend a lot of time in maybe the founder-owned community doing that. When you get to the point of maybe lower middle market private equity where things are a little bit more sophisticated, typically you won't have as many, if any, personal expenses running through the company's p &L. And I think that's probably the biggest delineation is the, to your point, the cleanliness of the financials as it relates to maybe someone who's ran a business for 30 years, no intention really to sell prior, 
maybe treated it a little bit as a piggy bank, which to some degree is okay. And just kind of had their lifestyle, right? For a more structured, supported back office with a private equity fund that is very hyper-focused on every expense itemization, as well as classification and kind of being what's run through the business. So the answer to your story, we've seen quite a bit. And I always say I've seen it all. And then I get on another transaction. I'm like, yo, this is interesting. So. I won't say where it was, but uh, somebody brought me a pest control company because I own a small one and yeah. they wanted me to look through their due diligence. And this guy had exotic animals on his balance okay. sheets and stuff like, mm-hmm. yeah, zebras and tigers don't have anything to do with pest control. And he's like, well, I was going to use them for advertising. And I was like, but you didn't <laughs> like show me some ads where they're in there like that doesn't belong on there. But he was funding his collection of a little exotic farm he had through his. So I won't say where, what it was. I've seen some interesting things there. That, and he had two Escalades and some other stuff that he thought was part of the business. We see that quite a bit. We see maybe accessories of a lifestyle that try to tangentially become part of the business in the event of a sale. And that is something that we scrutinize pretty heavily because there is a fine line, right? Is it in fact a true qualified business expense or is it personal? And I think that We spend a lot of time on that again, probably more so in the founder owned community than maybe the private equity, but still certainly on both sides of the equation. Yeah. Now that we got the amusing thing out of the way there, let's talk about what's one of the cool things you're working on right now. I know we talked a little bit before the show, you got some cool stuff coming up. What are you working on right now? Yeah, we're working on next week. We're actually going to be launching in conjunction with KPMG, the first of its kind veterinary M&A conference. We're seeing a Tremendous amount of activity just in macro healthcare. Specifically, mm-hmm. it seems like in the last 12 to 18 months, private equity going a little bit more aggressively into the veterinary space. And that's at the clinic level. That's at the pet product level, any tangential service offerings that affect the clinics. So we felt that kind of combining those two brands and hosting a first of its kind for the investor community was something that, that made some sense and something we're very excited about. That really does dovetail into probably an area of growth that I see within just the general investment space is. You hear a lot about ambulatory surgical centers. You hear a lot about DSOs, dental service orgs. You hear a lot about hospital consolidation, of course. But there's such a demand in the vet space and really finite supply of DVMs. If you look at the age trajectory, if you look at the, there's only 32 vet schools in the US, right? Hyper competitive to get into. And they're only pushing out so many veterinarians per year. Yet the pet population, which now, as it should be, being treated much more like a family member, maybe versus 20 years ago, where your dog may have stayed outside most of the time. You would go out to feed it, maybe play with it and come back in. Now I see pet owners spending 500000 a month on, on pet care, organic foods, kind of et cetera. So we're seeing a lot of movement in that space. And we feel that sub-niche of the healthcare market is relatively defensive. As you think of COVID, where the pet population, in theory, increased, right? When you think of the number of owners who maybe are working at home, a little bit lonely, maybe had some downtime and said, I feel like something's missing. And that, that led them to get a cat, a dog, or a companion. Yeah, I think it's very logical that the private equity is looking at this right now because when the economy goes sideways or gets – right now, I would classify it as unstable. One day we're in a recession. Next day it's going to be a depression. The next day like we're going to have a currency total cu- currency collapse and be Venezuela. It depends on who you talk to and what minute you talk to them, right? So in those moments of uncertainty, you look for things that seem safe and secure. And We are addicted and passionate about our animals. If I was going to put money into something like that, I even own some domains around pet stuff. Like on the online side, I buy websites and revenue generating. I always tell people B2B, but I would definitely look at something in that pet space if it's already revenue generating because – it's not recession proof, but it's definitely recession resistant. Agreed. It's very logical that they're looking at this. And like I said, before the show, I told you I looked at the veterinarian space and it was the like for an individual group doing roll ups and stuff. The MSO managed medical service organization you need to set up per state. Right anywhere between it looked like about 18 to uh, depending on the state could be as much as forty five thousand dollars to set up all the legal fees to set up do that. And for those of you guys that don't know, the newer guys listening to the show, in most states, you can't own a veterinary clinic unless you're a veterinarian. One of the ways around that is what's called a medical service organization. And dental has their own called a dental service organization. So when he said DSO, but you can set up the organization and the kind of the fine line is you can't tell the veterinarian what he can treat, how he can treat it, what medicine he can use, but you own the facility. He's an employee of you. But there's some fine rules inside of there of what you can and can't do and tell him. But it gives you an opportunity to roll it up. We looked at it, and it's just the overhead cost 
it slowed us down on that. We had funders for it. It was just one of those things. COVID it's, hit. It's certainly an attractive industry. Historically, you would see a lot of corporate aggregators, much more strategic buyers in the space. And, and private equity is kind of come, dip, gone from dipping their toes into kind of going chips on the table, if you will, over the last few years. And I think a lot of that is a lot of them have a healthcare dependent thesis. However, many healthcare companies or industries or sectors deal with insurance companies. When you think of the vet industry, in many cases, it's private pay. But the DBMs are taking in private pay. Maybe the pet owners are getting reimbursed on the back end from their insurance company, but the majority of the business is private pay. And you look at the average DBM per clinic that's doing in revenue, probably anywhere from six to 700,000 per year, depending on the cost of living in the area. If you scale that model, you take that one DBM clinic to two to three, you're going to get immediate multiple accretion as well as you kind of go upstream in the market. So, you know, I think it's a very viable play for PE and for corporate aggregators. There's 30,000 clinics, vet clinics in the U.S. I would say that there's probably 50 corporate aggregators that own 10 or more clinics. So there's still a lot of room left to consolidate or roll up. And I think that's equally appealing to, to again, the private equity space as they think of the vet thesis and why that could make sense. Now, a lot of times these guys are selling or they're moving on the seller side of this. Do you work with the veterinarian? Like in this scenario, are you guys going to be working with the veterinarians themselves on the seller side? I would say that we're kind of buy sell side agnostic. We have team members that heavily focus on more buy side Q of E type work, CDO, the operational commercial diligence. We have team members that are kind of much more 10 toes down in the sell side of the equation. I would say predominantly for us, we're probably more in this particular niche on the buy side as it relates to dealing with the aggregator or the acquirer. Uh, we have frequent interaction with the DBMs. And I'm kind of finding one of the reasons or linchpins that a DBM would maybe consider the average DBM today is, I believe, 46 years of age, mm -hmm. probably getting to the point they're looking at a transition plan to an extent. And they're probably tired of working on the back office, managing employees, handling finances. And when you roll to an aggregator, you kind of forego that and you kind of hand that off. What that allows them to do, more importantly, is focus on the clinical side of work, which is really what they're trained in and typically what they're passionate about. So I think that a lot of people view private equity as the big bad wolf, and I can understand that to an extent. But at the other side of the equation, the yin and the yang, there's also some value add, I think, to be drawn from, from shifting to either a corporate aggregator or private equity consolidator. So I've always had a knack for just really getting into people about their, like having people just tell me all about their business. It's just something sure. I'm fascinated about it. So I always get it. One of the dentists I went to in Oklahoma, they were the result of a DSO, a <laughs> national chain of them. And I asked him, I said, why would you work here as opposed to own your own thing? And he said, I just want to be a dentist. I don't want to do all the rest of it. I want to come in here and help people with their teeth and go home. All right. And I think the veterinarians are the same way. I think you have two different groups of people who sell you a veterinarian clinic. Mm -hmm. There's just people who want to treat animals and help animals. And they don't want to do what you said. They don't want to do anything like that. And then you got the group of people that are like, they've done that long enough. It's time for them to retire. The only concern I have with that is you just said that dentists, I mean, not dentists, veterinarians are hard to come by. Finding the right young veterinarian to take over veterinarian clinic is one of the biggest concerns we had when we were looking at buying these up and doing roll-ups is it's sure. a, a very often more often than almost anything else, I think heat and air is almost this way for the small to medium guys. The lead guy is so operator central, like the, the operator dependent, I think is the word I should use, that mm -hmm. replacing them is an art. You look at different niche specialties within vet. So maybe take away primary care and move to equine. Equine mm -hmm. is probably the, one of the most needed as it relates to specialty services within vet. And you look at just overall why some DBMs may be leaving the industry is very much similar to what you see in the medical doctor, traditional medical doctor, or even RN world, where mm -hmm. a lot of burnout, massive caseloads, very much compassion fatigue, going through the constant kind of ups and downs of becoming attached, maybe tangentially to, to the patient and having a, a, not a good end result. So I think a lot of that plays into it as well. And we're in a very fascinating when you take the DVM out of the equation, you think of support staff, again, going back to maybe the nursing side, when you think of vet techs, vet mm -hmm. nurses, there's an equal shortage there, not selling that that point, but joining an aggregator in a maybe a closed geographic area may allow you to leverage some of this staffing model that the aggregator consolidators set up that maybe otherwise you don't have. I live in the Midwest where you may see a DVM that covers a 40 to 50 mile radius, right? Because it's a very rural area. Versus the density that you might see on the coast, whether it be California, New York, New Jersey, et cetera. So it's certainly geographic specific to an extent, but I think it rings true a little bit that there's value add if you want to stay in the practice and continue to run it. And there's value add if you want to slowly transition out to your point, 
and have maybe a new graduate from a DBM school come in and, and run the clinic thereafter. I grew up on a farm out in the middle of nowhere. Our idea, like the small animals, we took to the vet mm. and the big animals, the vet came to us. And very often we just called the vet and told him what we were dealing with. And he would have us pick up, like for the cattle, we had cattle. He'd just pick yeah. up the shots and stuff and we'd go out there and give them to our cattle ourselves. Like we took blood samples from our cattle and take them to the vet. Like sure. he, taught us, he just taught us how to do how to do it one time. And we just went out there and, you know, took samples or did whatever he needed and dropped it off. And he would give us whatever we needed because he didn't have to come out. I'm just trying to think, how does it scale on an aggregator? You can't do telemedicine, right? I guess you can <laughs> You give a farmer a cell phone and say, point it at the wound. I need yeah. to see it. But I wonder, like, how do you bring modern technology? How does some of the stuff that's really done a lot in other realms of private equity, where they modernize things, they do bring some of the other cross-industry technologies in when they come in? Sure. I certainly think there's, to, to an extent, like any business or industry, there's performance improvement, right? So when you acquire a company, that's typically step one, probably the easiest step. Anyone with capital can buy a company. It's right. really understanding if there is an integration or if it's a standalone enterprise, what operational levers do you have to pull? How do you extract working capital? How do you optimize patient flow? So when you think of technology and just from a pet perspective, charting out next day appointments or scheduling your patients more tactically, right, in the vet space. I think a lot of that goes into the overarching value at thesis of PE is they may go a little bit more business intelligence focused, a little bit more deep dive in, into proper cadence of scheduling and different resources. And I do think there's also some technology similar to other medical fields that they're allowing maybe vets to increase the pace of each visit. So maybe instead of meeting with a with a pet owner for 10 minutes, now it's down to seven. If you scale that over a year, that's a big time grab. So I think that there's, again, I think there's a lot of tangential offerings in the industry that maybe you see in, in macro healthcare. Now, telehealth is interesting because I do think there's applicability for very, very citable or seeable symptoms. Now, if it's something within the stomach or otherwise going to be very difficult, the pet can't speak, unlike maybe a child or, or something. But I do think there's maybe light to moderate applicability there as well in telehealth. I could also see the thing where you, if you had a, a 10 or 15 clinics, you have one really good like a master vet like somebody's just mm -hmm. really good at stuff and then he it's something that these newer vets coming in that you bring veterinarians you bring in have somebody to lean up to to say sure. hey i haven't seen this one before here's the symptoms here's the photos here's the blood work and then that's a telemedicine thing where they got somebody looking into their files and stuff there's possibility there i can see it what other realms do the i mean right now private equity brings something to the table that a that an individual buyer may or may not be able to do. Mm -hmm. With the interest rates and everything else going on, private equity might be able to push a little bit more on getting better offers to these veterinary owners than you or I could because of the interest rates yeah. and the debt coverage service ratios and all the stuff that the SBA would require us to fall under. I think what you're seeing in private equity predominantly now, a lot of private equity funds right now are very cash pure. They have so much capital to deploy that it's almost insane to think about, but in maybe the smaller, lower middle market cases, what you'll typically see is a private equity fund go in and put the minimus capital down. Mm -hmm. They'll try to share some of the risk, maybe the interest rate risk and the business risk by way of seller financing and then structuring an earn out on top of that seller financing based on revenue hurdles, EBITDA hurdles, whatever they may be. And that's kind of hedging a little bit of their operational risk as well as their interest rate sensitivity as well. Because to your point, if they go to a traditional lender, whether it be SBA, whether it be otherwise, and they factor in where the interest rates are today on top of their cost of equity, their weighted average cost of capital is through the roof. So then it becomes a thesis of, does this even make sense to do if we can't potentially structure seller financing with an earnout out kicker management equity role to where our, our leverage is relatively minimal as opposed to the old model, the LBO, the LBO era, where yeah. it was maximum leverage and interest rates were at the floor at the time. All right. Let's switch gears a little bit. We talked sure. a little bit about the show. You have a lot of experience on the seller side of things. And we were mm -hmm. talking about seller side psychology and, and mm -hmm. what a seller goes through on the on a transaction. What is your experience with that? And then based off that, I'll probably have some good questions for you there. No, I think it's interesting. We've seen throughout our careers a variety of instances in a, that maybe are independent of one another. So you may have sellers that, that have contemplated a transaction for many years and finally just said, and COVID was actually a precipice of a lot of this, finally said enough's enough with this extra headache, it's time. And it's a very smooth, kind of very seamless process. I mean, diligence wise, you may have some cleanup. There, there may be some things to think through, but overall the seller's ready. And you have other instances probably Equally as frequent where the seller may engage a bank, they may engage a diligence provider, they may be ready to run a process, but throughout that process, they're realizing that, hey, wait a minute, I've done this and centered my life around this for 25 or 30 years. This is my identity. 
right? And am I ready to truly give up my identity? I'm known as the guy that owns ABC LLC. That's all I've always been known. Without that, what do I become? And I think that sellers, in all reality, I mean, we're human beings. I think that there's certainly a struggle with detachment, a struggle with potentially losing that identity. I have seen deals personally, in many cases, start and stop based on that. And the sellers predominantly are pretty transparent as to why that is. Typically, if they're not, you can kind of see that there's some hesitation. But, you know, we try to, and I say we as just a general advisory community, or at least they should, as a general advisory community, kind of walk step in step, depending on what side of the deal we're on with the seller, kind of assure them in any way we can. We're not, as a diligence team or a performance improvement team, we're not going to guide them to sell or not to sell. We're kind of, we have to slow the pace down of our work. We'll do that. If they want to take maybe a break, pencils down for a period of time, happy to act. We ask to that. But overall, it's, it's, I think, just understanding that a lot of people get caught up in the transaction itself and forget that there's a human element, right, to the deal. A lot of times in private equity, it is very transactional. There is not the emotional attachment. It's what is the multiple at the market level? What is my offer? And if it's likable, how quickly can I get out of this asset? So very much more, you know, kind of to the point, stoic, if you will. So definitely a different path when you're an advisor, a banker, a diligence professional to kind of understand your client or the target, depending on what side that you're on, and kind of their hot buttons and emotions that they may be going through. Because again, this is a, in many cases a, a very big deal or transition for somebody who's attached their identity to this for so many years. It's interesting you say that because one of the things that comes up, I've interviewed quite a few people who, some of them just for fun and didn't put on sure. the show because they didn't want to, they didn't want to be on the show, but they wanted to tell me their story, mainly because it couldn't be on the show yet. You're telling me your story right after a, after an acquisition. We can't publicize that because yeah. they have certain rules, right? That said, often when I ask somebody like, why didn't you sell the private equity? They were offering you almost one and a half times what the other guy offered you. And mm -hmm. they said the actual answer probably I can count on, it would take both hands to count it. Of the times I've talked to people six or seven times, I've been told that private equity is so cold. It was just numbers. Sure. They didn't care about the people. They said, I didn't feel like they cared about the people. I didn't feel like they cared sure. about anything. They just cared about the numbers and the transaction and the mathematics of it. And I built something here with real people. And these people are my friends. You own a company for 30 years and you spend 45, 45 to 80 hours a week, depending on whether you have a good week or bad week around these people. A lot of times that's all you need. Yeah, and I, I think private equity, I think it's like anything else. It, it's case by case, right? I think there's great firms, very kind of empathetic to situations. Certainly there's outliers to that. I would say yeah, overall, I'd probably say the general private equity landscape is relatively empathetic. Now, when you get into the more public market deals and, and you start talking about maybe the juggernauts of the industry, that could differ slightly. But I think in the lower middle market specifically, you have to be because if the relationship between a potential seller and a private equity firm is already off to a cold start, it's not going to materialize and go anywhere. It's much more mindful or in the minds of private equity professionals in the middle, the lower middle market is to, again, that little bit of extra empathy and kind of treating it beyond the numbers. Numbers are key, but numbers aren't everything. If you don't have the human capital, you don't effectively have a business. It's interesting you say that because the more I think about it, the people that said that were bigger transactions, they, they would have never qualified for SBA copy line. They were in the, sure. let's say between 15 million valuation to one of them was closer to 50. They were bigger deals talking to PE and strategic acquisitions. And they had mature, like one of the reasons I like talking to these guys is they already had teams in place. Two of the guys had already kind of semi-retired out and was just owning and running from afar and it was time to sell. One of the guys tried to do an ESOP first and it just didn't, he didn't feel that it worked. I think he used the wrong facilitator to set it up for him. That said, there were bigger transactions and I guess maybe there's a different expectation. PE came in, seeing everything was buttoned up and running right and just assumed they didn't need that personal connection. And I think it was the wrong assumption to make when somebody's touched and owned something, for, but they built by hand for 35, then in one case, 40 something years. No matter whether or not it looks buttoned up or how logical or alpha the guy seems or what sort I'm looking for on the disc profile there, the D or whatever, where you're just like, give me the facts or I mean, or give me the high level facts and just make a decision. Even if they come across that way, I'm very high level on that. Just like, give me the confidence you can do it. Tell me what you're going to do and let's just go. It's and, almost like, yeah, it's almost like the dominance theory, right? Of that. And I think that plays a little bit into to your point. When you think of what I call upstream private equity, like your bulge bracket firms in, in the deals they're working on. I mean, there's thousands of employees in these companies. When you're in the lower middle market, you may acquire a company with a, an owner or two employees. So I think right. that the touch point at the employee level also is very different, right? You may be dealing with, a, again, upstream, just a leader of a unit, a business unit, whereas 
the lower minimum market, you may, you're likely dealing with all the employees of the company to some degree. And I think that those relationships get forged a lot earlier, which is probably why it's a little bit more, we'll say as a more human element than maybe just a numbers element when you go upstream. Let's circle back. There was a question of the veterinarian services. What multiples do they play in? What multiples would they sell if they sold to like an SBA loan if they're small? What off? What multiples can they achieve through private equity and roll up? And is it the standard? I think the standard inside of most industries is a PE firm buys like 80% of at least 20% on our table or 70, mm -hmm. 30. And then they have an upside. They have a second chance at that earn out or the ability to have a second exit when the PE firm exits. So can you That's give right. me an idea of the deal structures you're seeing or kind of ballpark range? Yeah, I think, you know, it's if you were to ask me this question a year ago where that was trading at an all time high, I mean, we, we've seen in, in mostly, you know, I would say actually all these that I'm going to reference, just broadly speaking, public data, if you will, but we've seen anywhere from 15, 20 times in cases. A lot of that plays in the scale, right? What is the scale of, of the, is it going from aggregator to aggregator? If you go to a one DBM clinic or even two DBM clinic, you're not going to get, obviously, you're probably going to not, ah, Maybe then you'd break eight times EBITDA. In this market, there's a lot of pause. Again, interest rate sensitivity. I think there's DBMs and other business owners just struggling with the economic uncertainty of what to do, right? Is exiting now going to last me until retirement? Very real concern. So multiples, I wish I had a, a more finite answer, but they are truly all over the place. But it's truly dictated based on revenue size, scale of the clinic, and I would say geography as well, right? Are you in a major metro or secondary? Are you in a tertiary market? And what your competition look like in a media 10 mile radius? Was there an opportunity within a pet clinic to scale and add another potential DBM or other staff? So I think a lot of that goes into the value add kind of player value creation play, if you will, but PE and non-PE for that matter, kind of look at. So inside of that realm, like what is this, what do the deal structures kind of look like? Are they like, well, there's cash up front, of course, and then yeah, there's yeah. an earn out and What's the play for the private equity? A lot of times these guys, are they building these like holding codes or are they actually building these like typical private equity model where they're going to roll them up and aggregate them up and they're in and out in three to five years? I would say in the past eight to 12 months, it's pivoted a lot more to the private equity model, right? Where I think the thesis is like many other investments, we're going to acquire, we're going to add as much value as possible. We're going to performance improve. We're going to continue to bolt on right to the platform that's acquired. And in three to five, seven years, depending on the underlying fund mandate, that's when we're going to contemplate harvesting and exiting, right? Historically, I do think, again, just given the defensive nature of the vet, and just generally in healthcare, and with the exception of pharmaceutical, is that the thought was, why not just carry these, right? Because they're, for the most part, cash flow, cash pure, and uh, they're relatively stable investments, and maybe not look to exit in three to five years, but maybe more green fund, right? Maybe more long-term and kind of ride out the evolution of, of pure value extraction at the end of the day. But again, when multiples are trading, going back to 12 months ago where they were, everyone and anyone who could was trying to come to the table and get the highest price they could command. So their original thesis on day one may have drastically changed when they were able to get two to 300 more basis points on their multiple accretion than they ever anticipated just based on movements in the market, right? So I think at the end of the day, private equity is always going to be an investor, right? That's what they're there to do for their LPs. And I think they're they're going to focus on what's going to generate their maximum, most maximum risk adverse return possible, kind of even independent of time frame, if that makes sense. Let's run through a scenario real quick, because I'm curious on the answer to this. I'm a veterinarian. I have a decent sized clinic in my, my market. I'm not. I'm saying this scenario. Yep. <laughs> in this scenario, you're a veterinarian. We have a decent sized veterinarian clinic in, in a market. And I'm thinking about exiting. What's my process to go through. What should I do to maximize that? Let's say it's a year to three years out. I'm willing to work on work on things, change things for the next two to three years to maximize my retirement fund. Sure. What are some of the things these private equity firms are looking for and how can I create something that would be very attractive to one? It's an interesting question. A lot of times private equity, for the most part, depending on where they sit, it, whether they're growth capital or otherwise, is going to look for a company in general with, with some meat on the bones, meaning is it fully value added or has value been created to its maximum extent or is there still avenues to, to drive more value? It's much more case by case, but when you think of a DVM or a really business owner in general, right? When you think of cost reduction kind of plays that may exist, you think of systems and softwares, right? Are they using optimal systems or softwares? Is their order to cash or procure to pay methodology kind of fully up to speed, right? Is their working capital management fully up to speed? Is their financial reporting seamless to where it could tuck into a private equity fund if required? 
So I think it's very similar to what you would see maybe otherwise. I would say probably in the vet space specifically, it's increasing, and this just comes down to revenue generation, right? It's increasing the number of cases that you could see per day, right? So does that mean you extend hours or does that mean you shorten case visits? Does that mean you expand staff or does that mean you rely on technology more heavily? And I think those are the questions probably DVM centric that go through their minds as you think of maybe a year, 18 months out of a potential exit. And then once they're at that point, it's a decision of, okay, I'm at the point where I feel I'm ready. Do I want to go and enlist a banker to, to market me to the widest pool possible? Do I want to potentially reach out to an aggregator, maybe have a relationship with them through my bank or otherwise, and go direct there? And that's typically one of two paths. There are DVMs who list their own companies for sale, right? We see it all the time where they may utilize LoopNet or something similar, buy biz sell and say, you know what? I don't want, I don't want any of the noise. I want to control everything end to end. So I'm just going to run this process myself. And We've seen successful exits that way. Interesting. Yeah. Now, are the private equity interested in only the veterinarian clinics or some of the ancillary stuff like med like I think about small medical clinics and then you got ambulatory services, you got medical yeah. supply companies, you got oh, yeah. there's all these supporting companies that if you were a holding company or a company that was acquiring of that particular in that industry, it would sure. be beneficial to actually kind of fill in the gaps around. Are they these PE firms looking at the pet medical supplies and pet medical devices and all yep. the other stuff too? 100%, 100%. I think the overarching piece is, is how can we all become vertically integrated, right? Within our own infrastructure. And I think right. when you think of, to your point, pet supplies, pet products, pet foods, it, it may be something is a pet lifestyle, right? There's now pet lifestyle brands that exist that maybe didn't exist three to four years ago. There's also an emergence of a lot of DBMs are turning patients away or pet owners away because they just don't have the capacity. So what you're seeing now is more of a flooding to vet emergency rooms, right? So there's an emergence now of what's almost known as vet urgent care, which may differ from your traditional day-by-day -day DVM, similar, you know, primary medical that we would go to. So absolutely think in field ones, private equity funds and otherwise acquiring tangential or ancillary service offerings that, that further support and augment their platform, right? Whether that be Again, medicine related, whether it be product related, whether it be food related or otherwise, but definitely trying to control the vertical integration as much as possible. I think that in and of itself can drive multiple accretion pretty quickly and efficiently. So now we're going to end up with the pet ambul ambulatory services, pet yeah. outpatient service, like surgeries and <laughs> centuries. The whole nine yards. The whole yeah. nine yards. You know, take your dog to an outpatient surgery center. Yeah. For anyway. On a funny side note, I just, I saw this just a week ago. I didn't even know this exists, but in, I believe the company's based in, I don't know if it was New York City or Boston, but it's a pet massotherapy clinic. So they will actually, like you go know, for yourself, you have 30, 60 minute sessions where they'll come and they'll work on your pet, massotherapy on your pet. And that's something, again, growing up, having animals my whole life, I cannot recall one time that my parents said, hey, Kev, jump in the car. We're going to go take our, we're going to take the dog to the massotherapist. It just didn't exist then. So, so what's um, massotherapist? I'm thinking of massage. Yeah, massage. I mean, it's for circulation and blood flow. And I know like golden retrievers have hip issues, all those things. But again, three to four years ago, <laughs> never would have thought, never would have thought or heard of it. When it. Right. On the way through here to move to California, we drove through one of the towns. I seen a mobile vet clinic. It was an RV converted into a veterinarian thing. Oh, wow. So basically you just, they just pull into you, pull into your work and you can bring your dog to work that day and go get its vaccinations and have it checked up and have its teeth looked at. Now I've seen mobile dental clinics and the other stuff, but I have never seen a mobile veterinarian clinic, but until about a year ago, I was driving, drove past one, actually stopped and looked at, I think I have a photo of it somewhere because it was a big, nice luxury motor coach style oh, RV. Yeah. They actually made something. It was a really nice high-end RV that they converted to a mobile veterinarian clinic. I think the biggest thing that it, overall that needs to be thought through the vet space looking forward, right, is much more when we talk about supply and demand, right? There's such a great demand, finite supply, finite veterinary schools. I know in New Jersey, they just, there was a, a large grant. They're going to be launching one, I believe, at Rowan University, which is very exciting to see. First vet school in New Jersey. I think more of that's going to only help, right? It's figuring out how we, if we're anticipating by 2030 that we need 41,000 more DVMs, for, if we continue to the pace and trajectory we were on, fully graduate everyone, we still have a 15,000 DVM gap. How do we plug that, right? And I think that's going to be the overarching question that if private equity can plug or figure out, they're going to do very well. How do they match that supply or finite supply with, with what seems to be infinite demand at the moment? Yeah. It's a topic near and dear to my heart. I have a seven-year-old little red-haired, blue-eyed fireball of a girl who 
has never seen an animal she doesn't love. That girl would run up and hug a grizzly bear if I wouldn't stop her. Uh, Two days ago, we walked up on a pit bull that was growling, had its ears back at me, and she wanted to hug it because it was mad. And I was like, no, you back up. And the owner's like, it doesn't bite. I think, yeah, I've been bitten by people. I've bitten before by pit bulls. And then right before, right after the owner said, dog doesn't bite, they grabbed me by the leg. But yeah, it, it, nothing happened in that situation. I could really see her being a veterinarian or marine biologist or something. If she never loses her love for animals, she, she pretty much only eats chicken because she's figured out that every, where everything comes from. And she's like, yeah, I don't yeah. want to eat that. Yeah, I, I like cows. I'm not going to eat that. Yeah, so, that, that, that's but. great. So uh, just going to the other sides of what you guys do, Sure, we talked about a little bit about the due diligence side, just the quirks of it and stuff like that. We talked about the seller side. Let's talk about integration and stuff like post-sale. It looks like you guys do some integration planning and execution. Yeah, we do both integration and separation. We call it IMOS, in the integration management office, separation management office. And in the separation side, just briefly, is kind of much more focused on if a company is going to spin or carve out a business unit, right? What does that look like when you think of standalone costing, current and future state operating models, synergy assessment, disenergy analysis, for that matter as well. But more, much more frequently on the integration side, where you have a company that's acquired a bolt-on or acquired maybe a secondary platform and a year's gone by. Typically, we see this. Maybe it's a year or two has gone by and it's, okay, we haven't had time or we've been very busy acquiring. Now it's time to do an integration. And that's typically where we kind of come in and focus on a, building out a playbook, kind of thinking through what a cadence looks like over the first 90 to 180 days. What functional areas make sense to to become shared service centers? What processes and procedures can be shared? Unfortunately, you'll come into cases where human capital wise, there could be duplicative efforts, right? So then it becomes a little bit of a cost reduction play as well. But it but the end goal of it is truly to fully optimize the enterprise, right? In totality to make sure that when we leave or any integrator leaves, that all levers have been pulled that can be pulled to truly again create an optimal outcome so the company can focus on thereafter just general performance improvement up and through their own independent exit. I'm fascinated with divestures. I've had a lot of people on the show talk about them. Sure. I've only had one guy on the show that's actually acquiring them and he was pretty good size. He was buying computer security companies at $50 million and above. So uh, he's done quite a few. Uh, sure. That said, like, I want to say, I don't remember if it was 25 or 50. It was, he'd done quite a few over the years and uh, had a, it's a I'm fascinated because I keep hearing over and over again, you got great deals, but my concern is I don't know anything about the space. And secondly is I have to imagine it doesn't come with the leadership, right? You're not going to get your CFO, the VP, all this stuff you would normally get if you acquire a company, you know, where the main leader might be leaving, but, or you can have them retain for a little bit. But on these divest, you're, you're basically getting, getting the customer, but what do we get, right? Like you get the customer base, the technology, some of the team, what comes with a company that's going to divest themselves of some entity sure. within the organization? So, so good example. So when you think of, let's, let's think of a holding company with three business units, right? And we'll say mm-hmm. that business unit A is going to be carved out of the whole code. Business unit A likely has, for the, now I'm not saying back office, but front office likely has dedicated individuals. If you're a current state operating model, you could say, yes, this person's going to lift and shift with, with the, mm-hmm. or no, this person's maybe an F and A finance and accounting that's serviced by the back office. So we have to fill that role, right? So when you think of filling that role, does that mean we go to market? Do we outsource? Kind of what do we do there? You hit the nail on the head. You're traditionally in almost every case, not going to get hold code leadership in a carve out scenario. I mean, a lot of times you have to backfill that. So maybe you have a you have an operator or operators in house that you pull in. Maybe it's go to market type search, but a lot of times that's a big consideration. And many times you'll see a you'll see what's called a transition services agreement, right? So maybe I carve out once again business unit A from Holdco, but Holdco is going to support me for the next eighteen months on the F and A and IT functions, right? It's just a very finite period of time transition service agreement to allow me to get my feet under me. You'll also see in more limited cases, what's called a master, master service agreement, which goes into perpetuity, right? When you think of an MSA, maybe the support's going to be ongoing and there's no intent to cut it off at a definitive period of time. So all of those kind of things go into planning for whether it be a spin, carve out, whether someone's going to cut to IPO, different vehicles can be used to the best. But overall, the, the methodology of current and future state op model and really understanding the synergy and synergy. And this is both on a buy and sell side, because if I'm carving out a unit, I want to know what synergies I'm losing, right? By doing that. Not maybe just immediate hit to uh, to inflows based on purchase price as well. Maybe I missed it, but what I heard inside of there was all within the private equity holding co spitting something off. Do you guys yeah. work much with like the bigger companies? That, I like they have. I'm going to use it. In, sure. Huge example here. Google buys companies all the time, sure. and a lot of times those companies have very lucrative side projects 
aren't the reason Google bought it, right? So Google sure. might buy a company that's just a great idea, but they have a little side project that has a piece of software doing, say, less than $10 million a year, mm -hmm. a team of five or six people. It has nothing to do with Google and nothing to do with the reason they bought it. So mm -hmm. they, a lot of times they'll just shut it down or they'll spin it off and sell it off. Mm -hmm. So do you mess with those type of divestors at all? Do you guys work inside of that realm too or mainly in the PE firm? So I would say that predominantly it's within private equity. You know, if I look back through my career, probably more so at Ernst & Young, it was probably quasi private equity in large publics that are doing that to your point. You know, what I've seen though, in your scenarios that when they have this kind of tangential company or this bolt on that really isn't applicable to their day-to-day -day business, it's almost always fully staffed with independent employees, right? So the day one cutover of trying to backfill spaces or spots or roles is typically minimal because mm -hmm. you're going to have most of those employees lift and sh with the entity itself. There are instances, of course, where that's not the case, right? That not everybody likes being divested, right? So you're going to have employees in some cases saying, you know what? I don't want to be divested to X, Y, Z entity. I'm going to put myself on the market see where I can go. And that's something that in theory can be lightly predicted, but overall it's going to be relatively unknown until the transaction's complete, who's going to stay and who's going to go. So I've seen the vestigers fail to that regard where they had an exodus of staff and couldn't find people to backfill the roles. And all of a sudden you may have the customer list, but if no one can service that customer or sell to that customer, what can you really do? Right? So right. I think that leans a little bit more towards both private equity and corporates kind of acquiring in industries they know well, right? It's kind of the devil that, because right. if in fact there's an exodus of staff, they in theory should be able to backfill with other, other either portfolio companies or other pieces of a business, you know, within a corporation. It's like the guy I was talking about, he built something that people wanted to work for. I mean, he, people really wanted, <laughs> if somebody was in a divest to him those engineers wanted to go over there because they got to work with some really cool software, some really cool engineers. Sure. And even if they did leave, he had expertise on half and on staff that could take over and do, he had pretty much all the technology, all the roles. So we talked, you hit a, you hit a, a nerve on in this last conversation about people leaving part of your po proper integration planning and stuff is employee retention. So what is your process inside of employee retention? Where does that start? Like, and what part of the acquisition process does making sure you retain employees start in you guys' books? I think it's, number one, I'd say it's hyper isolated to the level of employee, right? Mm -hmm. So when you think of, and this is being practical, when you think of a manufacturing company, right? And you have, maybe you have a CEO, a COO, you have a director of manufacturing, director of quality control, all very high profile positions that, that likely need to remain as so. So you, you'll typically... And this would be outside of our scope, but you'll typically see the acquirer set up stock and set up packages and stuff like that. When you look at the individuals who are actually doing the core fundamental on the floor work, I would say those are much harder to really get underneath of to the extent where normally I'd say you set up a center of excellence, you set up a steering committee, you drive a common message, you drive a common theme, you, you try to maybe offer some low hanging fruit that, that is very incentivizing, but maybe isn't a huge overhead cost or otherwise. But when you're dealing with, I think, much more of the maybe the nine to five or multi shift employees who are really doing the output, right? They are running the day to day of the company. It's just very hard to isolate maybe a tool or a service that works in every case. We've, right. we've seen instances where even something as de minimis as advising to, to management, you should consider offering this has been a very stressful time. Maybe offer everyone an extra couple of days over the weekend just to give them some time to, to cool off and. And think about it. We had very good retention from that, right? These are people who would typically work six to seven days a week. These were paid days off. I mean, it, this means a lot, right? So mm. you can pull that off maybe a little more in the lower middle market. Again, when it's a much more kind of family-oriented business. When you start moving upstream and you start getting the large publics and, and upstream private, it's probably less about retention and more so, all right, they're going to leave. What do we do? Who do we fill them with, right? So it's not so much we need to retain them. It's immediately, how do we find that next person to take the seat, right? So I think that the methodology and the mentality differs a little bit when you think of large scale, mm -hmm. maybe Fortune 500, where a company that does 10 to 15 million in revenue and has, I don't know, 10 to 20 employees. I think it's just managed completely different because it has to be to an extent. It's interesting. So often the phrase employee retention and the percentage of retention after a transaction really bugs me. It's a like it's like people use it as a KPI, like we retain 65% of the employees, 75% of the employees. And the reason it bugs me is it's a trailing indicator, mm -hmm. meaning that to know how many people left is too late to deal with people who are looking to leave. Agreed. So 
I actually had, I've had some talks with, I'm a startup nerd by previous trade and I'm trying not to be that guy. I'm trying not to start other software companies and stuff, but there's a, a drive and I pitched it to somebody who's been on the show recently. He might be able to do something with it, but I'll give you the idea and we'll chat about it. I think there's a fairly logical and easy way to do a leading indicator for employee retention. And that's to baseline before you make the announcement of the acquisition or mergers mm -hmm. is to baseline all employees on all their social media. Like you, you have your list of your employees, you mm -hmm. look at their LinkedIn accounts and anywhere there's job resumes, anywhere there's res like, I don't even know that the world of Indeed and if Monster is still around or wherever the job sure, boards are, sure. these days, whatever the job boards are, if you put a baseline and do change detection through mm -hmm. the communication process, you could see a leading indicator how many people are updating resumes, how many people are updating their profiles way sooner and know, okay, well, we're not communicating very well. I've got 200 employees and 65% of my employees have updated their LinkedIn profiles sure, since sure. our announcement, right? That just sure. says, that says there's unsecure insecurity in the conversation. I think know. it's I think it's both ways too. We typically, like many consultants, will issue a series of surveys. And those surveys aren't directly stating are you leaving or are you going, but we can then kind of benchmark them against historical past and what you hear from what attrition's been, what retention's been. But what I found in those surveys, which is kind of fascinating to me when you think of just human psychology, is that I find people to be more honest in their responses when emotions are high mm -hmm. versus when it's a little bit more methodical and maybe they're clear headed. So they, the survey thesis, to your point, of getting ahead of things, right? So, so maybe getting before they've already put a foot out the door has allowed us in instances to maybe get our arms around. Maybe it's a whole function that's looking to just lift and shift. And maybe it's a small three to four people and they're all going to go to a competitor. But it has allowed us to kind of get underneath having one-on-one -on -one interviews, kind of understanding what the needs are. A lot of it comes down to the fear, right? A lot of these employees, God bless them, and I don't blame them, probably have a certain level of fear of, am I going to get cut? Am I going to be needed as I was historically with old co and new co. And uh, many times that's what's driving them going to market. It's not that the sale or divestiture is upsetting them. It's they're fearful. And I can't say that in many cases, if I were in that position, that I wouldn't have the same same reaction, to be honest yep. with you. I think it'd be cool to do. I think I do too. Absolutely. Yeah, I think it'd be fairly simple if you looked at some of the software that's already out there for consumer sentiment, like what the consumers mm -hmm. are saying about you. And you track, you can even use stuff like that. There's sites like Glassdoor and stuff like that yep. where people are like, making comments and stuff. You can almost do an AI tool that would basically give you a decent KPI on how many people of your, how, what's the likelihood, or I don't know what you would call it. There's probably another, a new phrase you could coin. What sure. the likelihood that your in, employee retention rate or your turnover, as we call it here, for all our UK guys, we're not talking about revenue. Mm -hmm. I talk to people all over the world in the UK and overseas turnover is the revenue. Here it's people leaving. <laughs> so the, <laughs> right. So like you could track, you could almost forecast it. I honestly think you could with the right AI tools and the right, and with con being careful of privacy, not like saying, sure. Hey, that Joe's about to leave. I, I think there's some concerns around privacy. You'd have to acknowledge and play within just for the fair use of data. Even though people are pu publicly posting this stuff, there's still some fair use of data, I think. I think you certainly can get directionally accurate as to what that looks like. I mean, if I look at a company of 50 employees versus a company of 5,000 employees, I'm going to be able to pinpoint probably, it's almost to the T in a 50 employee subset, who's going to stay and who's going to go. Right. When I get to that 5,000 data set or subset, that's where it gets a little bit more, I think, tricky is to maybe better understanding each and every individual's underlying psychology as it relates to feelings on the existing company, feelings on NUCO, job satisfaction, pay rate satisfaction, benefit satisfaction. You know what I mean? So many, so many variables. But to your point, Glassdoor, actually, interestingly enough, does capture quite a few of those when you think of reviews and kind of posts of happiness with the employer. And then the other side of it is you could forecast some other stuff too. Like I noticed in the tech industry, when I would go from one place to the other, uh, a group of my employees followed me like, oh, sure. and it happens a lot in the tech industry. I'm sure it happens in other industries too, sure. where a manager or a director or a leader goes from one company to another within two years, there's a core people, you know, there's a core group that will eventually work for them again. Sure. So it'd be a good tool to have inside your company go, Hey, if John leaves, there's a good chance that, you know, Joe, Sally and Nancy over here are going to go within the next year. Right. Yes. So I might want to keep John around. So that said, I just think there's some ability to and some tools that don't exist in this time that wouldn't be that hard to do. And I, I had a guy on the show that builds HR software. <laughs> and after the show, I was like, you know what? I'll probably never act on this. So I pitched it to him and he liked it. We'll see where he goes with it. He, what? 
One, one quick point you had that I thought was intriguing on, and the John scenario you just gave, John Lee, Sally, and Joe Lee. One thing that we, we try to pay a lot of attention to that I can't say many firms do is that you're going to have leaders with titles and you're going to have leaders who don't have the title, right? So right. if John is the manager, but Jesse's an associate who everybody likes and everybody kind of looks up to, John may leave and, and people may be jubilant. But if Jesse leaves, the whole staff's going. So I think we try to spend a lot of time understanding that type of makeup as well. Absolutely. Is that sometimes titles aren't indicative of true leadership within a business unit or within a company. And uh, that to me is always the fascinating of an integration, right? Because I'm inclined, we're always inclined to drive towards, well, if the CFO leaves, the finance team's going to leave. But the reality is if the director of FP&A leaves, the F&A team's going to leave, right? So that's, that to me is part of the science and art of getting underneath the functional areas to understand who really is the leader, right? At the end of the day, kind of titles aside. Yeah, titles don't actually always mean anything, especially in these small companies, 50 or less. Usually you have a visionary and an operator. So the visionary mm-hmm. is the guy who comes up with ideas and stuff, and the operators that get stuff done. Yep. I know of a case where a guy bought a company. He let go of the administrative assistant. In his own words, she's just too powerful, and the company just fell apart. His operator, the guy, the CEO that retired out, sure, pretty much basically came up with ideas and his office administrator, what they, I don't know what title they'd given her, but it was something like office manager sure. ran everything. <laughs> and oh, I've, he, seen that. I've seen when, that. Absolutely. He, I've seen that. Like, and the company required to do a lot of travel and stuff. When she left, nobody there knew how to do their own travel arrangements. She did them. All. Nobody knew how to do their own expense reports. She wouldn't let them because they would mess them up. So yep. she did everybody's expense report to them. They would come there, dump off some receipts to her. They talked to her for five minutes. She would draw them up and put them in the system. Right. Yep. She did. Yep. It was a 50 person company. She did all the stuff that was like, she was the glue of the company. She was what I would refer to as an operator, somebody that oh, yeah. just made the thing work. Right. So whatever needed to be done. She made the thing work, right? Like she's the person that called maintenance. Like if something broke, right? She knew all the numbers of maintenance and everything. So when the guy let her go, she, she just like smiled and walked out the door. She didn't say anything about like, hey, I, I hold this place together. Um, you know, we try to focus a lot too on on cross-functional training for that exact reason, right? If you have a key man, key woman that, that just decides to up and exit, maybe they win the lottery. Who knows? Who's going to backstop that role and who's going to take on those responsibilities? So Cross-training within a function and beyond even functional lines, I think, is a pretty critical part of an integration to make sure, again, that you're kind of backstopping any unforeseeable exit, whether it be by choice or otherwise. That's, so that's one of my favorite questions now to ask every person I've talked to within a company, whether it's online companies I'm dealing with now or even brick and mortar companies, what I was looking at for the last couple of years is sure. I ask every single one of them, I ask the CEO or the owner, who's key, who's critical, what do they do? And yep. then I might, and he's like, oh, you got to talk to our VP over here. And I asked him, who's key, who's critical, what do they do? And mm-hmm. then I go talk, if they let me talk to the next guy, I, I ask that guy, who's key, sure. who's critical, right? And uh, and it's important because I've seen cases where the CEO didn't, the CEO didn't realize how critical somebody was. I would agree. I would yeah. agree. 100% yeah. with that. 100%. Absolutely. Especially when you're in a larger organization, right? I mean, the CEO probably below his direct reports probably doesn't have a, a really good purview on everybody else, mm-hmm. even comment. Certainly. Yeah. I actually, uh, I work for a, one of those tech companies, I'll tell you, one of the VPs I work for, he could he could, he could have left it any second in the world and nobody would have missed it. <laughs> his, his tech guy that sat beside him and worked with him and went to every meeting with him was absolutely critical to having that place run. Yeah. Like that guy knew his stuff. Like even my team and myself, we would call him when something on our side, hey, we got this X, Y, and Z is going on. We've spent the next 10 minutes on it. Could you come log in and have us take, help us take a look at it? Right. Sure. But the VP could have disappeared off the place of the, I won't say where it was because everybody knew who I'm talking about, but and I don't know if he's even employed at the moment. I looked at his res- or his online thing the other day and it looked like he was looking for something. But that said, a lot of people just don't realize that. You just don't realize even this guy, you know, got, that particular guy didn't want to be anything but a lead assistant engineer. So that was his title. He didn't want to be a director. He didn't want to be a manager. He liked fixing broken stuff, right? Sure. Sure. And he could fix broken teams or broken software or code. So but he was absolutely critical to the glue to that place. Um, 100%. We see that quite a bit. You'll see that, again, you'll see, like you said, the VP or the hierarchy of titles, but the reality is two steps below is who's really running the show and who really, if they left, would be detrimental. Yeah, cool. Well, I think we're running tight on time here. Let's talk a little bit about, about more what, you, what you've what you got going on, what's coming up in the future. How do you want people to reach out to you? This is your chance. I really encourage you to make a pitch here. So you got something you want people to come to. You got a particular customer you're looking for. This is your shot to... Sure. To tell the world who you are, what you're looking for, and how we can be a service to you. No, that sounds great. So I would say for us, we are heavily focused on the lower middle market. That could be either private equity backed or family backed, fat or owned, et cetera. 
that is kind of the niche we've carved within our practice. Again, we try to be a Swiss army knife to the extent we can, right? We, we are a diligence focused group. So when you think of quality of art, you think of, again, operational or commercial due diligence. I would say that's absolutely kind of our expertise, yeah. kind of dovetailing that into integration, divestiture, SMO planning. But again, we've, we have a, a great team of professionals. The majority of the team, like myself, are former big four, former private equity. We've been in the trenches on a larger, we kind of understand also the nuances and have the empathy to, to work in the founder owned community. I personally really enjoy working with startups. I know a lot of, a lot of firms shy away from that, but to me, there's nothing more exciting than working with an entrepreneur who has a great idea and wants to see that idea come to fruition. So I would say re for me, reach out, certainly via email, via phone. I believe, Ron, you'll probably post that information somewhere, but always a phone call away. I try to tell my team consistently that our clients are why we're in business and we have to do everything we can to try to provide that kind of white glove service, irrespective of, again, whether it be a private equity fund or otherwise. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you being on the show today. And we'll Thank you call for having show. Awesome. Hang out for a second afterwards and we'll call that the show. That sounds good. Hey, it's your host, Ronald Skelton. I want to thank you personally for watching the show today and invite you to call our new hotline, 918-641-4150. That's 918-641-4150. Call us and tell us about our show, ask questions, uh, suggest a guest, or even tell me about a business you have for sale and we'll reach back out to you. Again, that number is 918-641-4150. Call our hotline, leave us some information. Thank you. I want to announce our new channel partners, the ITX Marketplace. Since 1998, ITX has created $5 billion in value by selling more than 225 IT businesses in 20 countries. ITX works exclusively with IT-enabled businesses generating between $5 million and $30 million who are ready to be sold and m and to decision makers who are ready to buy. For over 25 years, ITX has developed industry knowledge that helps determine whether a seller is a good fit for their buyers before making the match. ITX Mergers and Acquisition Marketplace, we have partnered with, has a proprietary database of 50,000 plus global buyers seeking IT service firms, managed service providers, Microsoft service providers, software as a service platforms, and channel partners with Microsoft, Oracle, ServiceNow, and, self, and, and the Salesforce space. If you have an IT-enabled business, you're ready to sell, I want you to visit the IT exchangenet.com slash marketplace how to exit that link will be in the show notes visit them now